Okay, welcome everybody. So we start the second part of the session. So with uh, uh, Dimitros uh, Kiratsis, uh, with, uh, about the latest advancement of the Earth space mission. So, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Okay, perfect. Yes. So I'm Dimitrios Kiradzis uh, from the Grand Sasso Science Institute, and I'm going to present to you an overview of the latest advancements of uh, the Hertz space mission. Hertz stands for High Energy Cosmic Radiation Detector, and since we are speaking about cosmic rays, I would like to make a very very short introduction to our playground. Our playground is this plot that you can see here. I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with this. And uh, for the sake of simplicity, I would like to divide this spectrum in three zones. One zone starts from the GV energy range. For us, it's somehow like the low energy range. Then it expands all the way to hundreds of TV. This zone here is what we characterize of energies achieved with current space-borne experiments that are employed in order to give us direct cosmic ray measurements in this range. It's very important to note in this moment that via direct measurements, we can probe the inherent characteristics of the spectra, and we can see differences in the sense that we deviate from the single power law model that we, we knew from the indirect measurements, and we enter the era of probing the inner structures and the inner features of the different spectra. Then, from hundreds of TV all the way up to the knee here, this is a gray area which has to be filled by upcoming or future space-borne experiments, since these are the maximal energies to be achieved by employing a direct detection of cosmic rays. Then, from this region onward, from the knee onward all the way up to the ankle, this is a region covered predominantly by indirect cosmic ray experiments, meaning ground-based experiments. Here you can see a selection of uh, space, space missions and some ground-based experiments. Some of them are upcoming, some of them are already up and running for many years, and some are fairly new. What is the difference between indirect and direct cosmic ray experiments? So, with indirect cosmic ray experiments, with ground-based experiments, we can achieve huge energies. We can reach all the way to the ankle energies that are not easily attainable by other detectors. But at the same time, we have a difficulty in making composition studies with small systematic uncertainties. Now, on the other side, when we speak about direct cosmic ray experiments, let's say space or balloon experiments, we can get precise measurements of the particle charge and energy. So since there is no atmosphere in between to act as a means of interactions, we can precisely measure the aforementioned uh, values. But at the same time, being a space-borne experiment, being limited uh, in its weight, it gives us a small exposure, that means a small acceptance operating over a smaller um, time interval, and thus we are provided with few statistically meaningful measurements abo above few tens of TV. So, what can be the solution to this? The, solu the solution to this is also what we postulate, is to have experiments with larger acceptance that operate over several years. In that sense, the exposure is way bigger, and then we can probe the cosmic ray spectra for the first time via direct measurements around the PEV energy range. This we really hope to be done with the high energy cosmic radiation detector. This is a space mission, one of the prominent ones to be installed on board, on board the Chinese space station around 2027. And its main scientific objectives revolve around cosmic rays with the precise spectrum mass composition up to the PEV as we mentioned before. Insight 
in uh, gamma ray astronomy and transient studies, an upgrade to the electron, the all electron spectrum up to tens of TeV, and indirect dark matter search with high sensitivity. The collaboration that is formed is an international synergy between Chinese, Italian, Swiss, and Spanish institutes, along with more institutes and researchers that are willing to join in this initiative. Now, how are we going to succeed in going higher in energy? We're going to do this. OK, first of all, I would like to start. The traditional picture of a space-borne instrument is when we instrument one side, and from this one side, we receive particles. So impinging particles, most of the times, come from the top. Now, we aim to change this by instrumenting not only the top side, but also the four lateral ones in order to gain this advantage while keeping, essentially, uh, the space mission and the space uh, payload under manageable uh, limits. Now, we start from the very center of our detector, where we can find um, a calorimeter, a deep 3D cubic segmented calorimeter that forms an octagonal prism in order to accurately measure the energy of the impinging particle that initiates a shower, a shower inside the, the calorimeter, while also giving us a very good separation between electrons and protons. Then, as we radiantly expand outward, we find the fiber tracker that is going to determine the track of all impinging particles. Then enveloping the above stated detectors, we have the plastic scintillator detector that will work as a veto, as anti-coincidence, while providing gamma ray charged particle triggers with an essential charge measurement. Then, in the end, enveloping all the rest, we have a silicon charge detector that is of great importance in ensuring a very, very uh, good measurement of the charge. Um, a bonus track on this is uh, a transition radiation detector, which will be a modular detector in one of the sides, in one of the lateral sides of the instrument in order to provide energy calibration uh, in the TeV energy range uh, for the case of nuclei. Now, regarding the expected performance, on the right, we have uh, a small table regarding the requirements, and on the left, we have the exposure with respect to the time. So let's start with the main requirements of this mission would be to, to, to reach an to have uh, an energy range from tens of GeV to tens of TeV regarding electrons, to probe the, the full gamma ray sky above 100 MeV for gammas, to reach an energy from 30 GeV up to 3 PeV for the light component in cosmic rays, and achieving this with a great angular and energy resolution, while also having an optimal separation between electrons and protons. The geometric factor, when we speak about five instrumented sides, of course, you can expect that it's highly uh, increased, and, you, and we will see also later on there. The mass of the payload will not exceed four tons, and its lifetime will be around 10 years, and hopefully more. Now, going to the left, we have the exposure with respect with the time. The, the, different, um, the different curves correspond to uh, the different contributions of space-borne missions, such as Dampe, Khaled, and AMS, current missions, and prominent in what they do in cosmic rays, starting from their respective launch time and going on. These are the nominal values here for their acceptance. Um, and then we can see that with a dotted line, we start from the 1st of June, 2022, and we think to the future. So everything from June onwards, uh, here is the future. So it's with a dashed line. Around 2027, we have the onset, we have the possible launch of HERT, and we can see this jump um, in exposure, this that comes from a jump in acceptance. And in the end, we can see that we have an order of magnitude upgrade in exposure with respect to current generation cosmic ray experiments. So this is a very, very important task when we speak about this specific task uh, on space detectors. Now we're going to the herd subdetectors here. First, we start from the epicenter, and we are going out. Uh, about the calorimeter, the calorimeter will be made up with cubic lyso crystals with three centimeters of an uh, edge side. 
uh, with a full amount of 7.5 thousand crystals, uh, leading amounting to uh, an integrated uh, 55 radiation lengths and three nuclear interaction lengths. This will be the deeper calorimeter sent to space. Um, then, as you can see here, each tube is read out independently by wavelength shifting fibers coupled to um, image uh, intensified scientific CMOS cameras, while a portion of them will be read out by photodiodes connected to custom front end electronics. This idea is taken uh, from the inspiring ColorCube project and is uh, very helpful for us to extend our calibration and its dynamic range while also reducing the systematics. Um, what I forgot to mention before, what I forgot to mention here is that this detector is made by uh, scientists, students that already worked, that already had experience in experiments such as AMS, Fermi, Dampe, Pamela, all these prominent missions, and Khaled as well. So um, we know we find the advantages and disadvantages of our detectors, and we try with the, the, next, the next generation uh, detector to, to solve them, let's say. And um, here we have uh, some graphs regarding the energy resolution from electrons um, from some tests that have been uh, taken in the SPS. Um, with a CMOS readout and with a photodiode readout. Then we move on to the fiber tracker. So we move from the, the very center outward. And uh, we have the fit. Again, five instrumented sectors as for all subdetectors. Each sector has uh, seven uh, interleaved planes on uh, X and Y directions. And each side and top plane have their own orthogonally placed modules here. Different from the top, different from the bottom. And uh, each module corresponds to one fiber mat that is read out by an array of three CPMs. Again, uh, with tests done at uh, CERN SPS with uh, proton beams, we see that we have uh, achieved a special resolution of around 45 microns. And also, since the fit can provide an idea of the charge, we also saw that uh, the charge resolution for nuclei heavier than protons is also very good in what we want to do. Then we move on to the plastic scintillator detector. The PSD of HERD will provide uh, identification of gammas by vetoing the charged particle uh, that will impinge on the detector and also provide a measurement of the charge. Now, what we're doing here is that we're investigating two different geometries. Um, two different scintillator designs, one based on long bars and the other one on square tiles. Both of them are read out by CPMs, individual CPMs. Um, all these configurations in our laboratories, our tests, are tested with uh, a multitude of particles from low energy electrons to low energy electrons to high energy cosmic muons, then uh, onward to beam tests from protons, pions, and uh, what we can see here is a, is a quick example regarding the, distrib the charge distribution of cosmic ray muons uh, in a specific trigger position along a bar which is read out by two CPMs per side. By taking the MPV of each one of these uh, uh, peaks, we can have an idea of the behavior of, of the most probable value of the peak with respect to the trigger position. And from this, we can get an idea on the light radiation length for, from all the trigger positions. Again, we're also doing chromaticity studies, both from the perspective of Monte Carlo, as well as uh, the configurations on our laboratory. And uh, moving on from the conventional rectangular bar design to the novel trapezoidal bar design, in order to, to have more hermetic uh, detectors in space. If you want to find additional info, uh, on this meeting's poster uh, from Corrado and Massimo, they will be very happy to help you. Then we move on to the last but not least detector of HERD, subdetector, which is the silicon charge detector made by silicon microstrips in order to precisely measure the particle charge. This is done because we thought that it's very important to minimize the fragmentation the possible fragmentation of impinging particles, impinging nuclei, 
and this is done with a very light silicon microstrip detector while also minimizing possible backsplash effect. This helps us very much in minimizing our systematics. As you can see, oh, since I have uh, not a lot of time, I have to go on. And this is also the resolution of the charge with respect uh, to the impinging zeta. And this is very good also, as we see, in comparison to the ones from AMS. Uh, this is part of our herd campaign, uh, which took place at CERN SPS and the PS in October and November 2021. Here you see the SPS. Uh, each one of the different subdetectors is placed in line with the um, with the beam, and uh, these um, these configurations were tested with protons, electrons, and pions of various energies. Here you can see also the, the same more or less configurations from PS, and the picture of the PSD bar prototype. Now let's speak for a very few minutes about the science that we can do with HERT. Um, the important fact here is that for we first of all we we will measure the cosmic ray fluxes individually from protons to irons up to their highest achievable energies in space. Then specifically for the light component, which is the protons and the helium nuclei, we would like to reach the first, uh, let's say, direct evidence of the knee, something that has been only indirectly by ground-based experiments. This is, these are the possible expected results for heard after five years of exposure in all three um, plots. Here we have protons, here we have helium, a possible onset of the break in the spectrum. And here we have the boron over carbon ratio. This ratio, the secondary over primary ratios, are very important in understanding the, the propagation of cosmic rays uh, in the galaxy. In the end, we're speaking about cosmic electrons and gammas. This is the expected flux of uh, herd after five years of operation. And we can see that something, the break at around 1 TeV that has been seen also by Dumper for the first time, confirmed I call it later, but there are no uh, results in this region, which was very important to see a possible contribution from, uh, from different sources. Then also regarding gamma rays, this is, um, these are, this is a Monte Carlo scheme of a five year sky map above 100 MeV since heard with its large acceptance and sensitivity, will be able to do a full gamma ray sky survey above this energy and will somehow be able to, um, to help after the, the, end, uh, the, the, the end of life of Fermi. Uh, this, is my, this is my last comment from this podium. I would like to say that we, we have fully entered the multi-messenger era and now it's our proposal to have a synergy with different experiments, not only in, um, in strictly cosmic ray nuclei, but also gamma rays like CTA with LASSO, and also for lower energies in the MEV range uh, with the upcoming mission of Crystal Eye, as you can see in uh, one of the following talks of Felicia Barbato, uh, with neutrinos, with KM3 and an ice cube, and with gravitational waves, and specifically for the electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves with LIGO and Virgo. So this is the end of my talk. And uh, in the summary, I presented to you very, very quickly the, uh, the idea we have, the initiative of HERD. And uh, it will be installed on board the Chinese space station. Its expected lifetime will be around 10 years. Um, uh, its scientific objective will revolve around cosmic rays, gammas, and possible indirect dark matter searches. The, the takeaway point is that by employing state-of-the-art detector techniques with a pioneering design, we can achieve an order of magnitude increase in, uh, in acceptance. And when this acceptance is coupled with uh, a very good um, life, lifetime uh, of a very long lifetime of the mission, we can get way better results. Uh, of course, ongoing work uh, is dedicated to hardware R&D and Monte Carlo simulations and dedicated beam test at CERN, SPS, and PS, and also um, the ones that we did in previous year. Also, we have from this September onwards to finalize the detector design and to also evaluate further performance aspects. So this is the end, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Rosita. There's time for a few questions, quick questions. 
So I was wondering if you happen to have a, a plot of the angular resolution for gamma rays, or if you... I, right now, I don't. In, the, in this presentation, I do not have uh, an angular. But the thing is the, um, that also from our proceedings uh, for ICRC, so all of them are clickable links. So since I cannot, I'm not able to fit everything in a 10, 15 minute presentation, all these are click clickable links, and we can also talk uh, offline about this. Okay, thanks. I'll take a look. <laughs> Another quick question. Ah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not entirely clear to me how you measure the energy of, of, a, of, a, of a proton, because if you have three uh, in the actual length, it's not enough to contain the shower. How, how do you actually get the energy? So we know very well that for uh, space, for space missions, for uh, detectors, we can uh, more or less, when we have an impinging particle, which, OK, let's also make it more uh, visual. So when we have a particle impinging, propagating, and it leaves, let's say, its mark on all of its subdetectors and reaches the calorimeter to create this, uh, to produce this shower, we know that we are containing only a percentage of this energy. And this is even more when we are speaking about very, very high energy particles. So uh, the segmentation of the calorimeter, first of all, and how deep it is in the sense of how many radiation length it is, helps us to increase this ratio. But at the same time, we know very well how to, to measure the impinging energy from the unfolding that we do also in a later stage. So we might not be able to contain the full energy of a particle. Let's say a, a PEV particle cannot leave all of its energy inside. But we know from the, from the shower structure how to reconstruct the energy of the impinging particle. And we do this in a, in a, very, in a very good approximation. OK. Now, thanks again, the speaker. And uh, we go for the next. So, which is uh, Valerio Bocci on a contact and uh, light all-in-one uh, detectors for the space application. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Well, I speak about compact and light uh, only one detector for a space application. Uh, I don't speak. Uh, there's a laser here or not? Yeah. 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 A little point. Okay. Uh, I don't speak about uh, uh, our last mission, foot by foot, uh, thanks uh, to the light uh, and the uh, low power. Uh, uh, necessity for this uh, detector, we launch some uh, balloon uh, up to the high atmosphere, up to 30,000 meters, uh, and we got the profile uh, of, the <coughs> of the radiation uh, of the cosmic uh, shower with uh, the, the density of particles for a unit of time. There are some beautiful photo we have done with the outreach of the NFN, uh, OCRA, and uh, C3M. Well, we created uh, this uh, uh, kind of detector starting in 2014, and uh, we publish, we realize uh, and publish this, this detector. The idea was uh, simple, quote by quote, because uh, the idea was to get a scintillator a silicon photomultiplier, a custom electronics that we create uh, just to adjust the signals, uh, and use uh, these uh, new uh, uh, microcontroller units uh, with the system chip uh, feature that was uh, an uh, Arduino 2. Uh, the idea now is uh, it's simple. I if you look around, uh, uh, all the experiment uh, speak about uh, silicon photomultiplier but uh, was not so clear in, the, in this time, at, this, at that time. 
This is the, re the reason was uh, the CPM uh, improvement uh, and uh, the first time uh, uh, a microcontroller unit with enough power, uh, computer power. Okay, this is uh, a silicon photomultiplier structure. As you know, it's uh, an array of uh, uh, SPAD, <coughs> single photon avalanche photodiode that you can read uh, uh, all together thanks to this uh, resistor uh, in, uh, in parallel. It's a technology that started in 1990, was uh, in the, the laboratory, uh, comes out from the laboratory in 2000, 2005. I remember the first prototype that arrived in uh, Rome 2 or Vergata from directly from the Russian people that designed this, uh, this kind of detector. And there was uh, some problem. Some problem <coughs> that start to be resolved just in the time when we, uh, we, have, we have started with this kind of detector. If you look at the Dark Council reduction, uh, at uh, 2009, uh, the typical uh, silicon photomultiplier, this is from uh, uh, one of the main company for silicon photomultiplier production, was uh, one megahertz, uh, one count per second uh, for square millimeter. And then uh, if you look at 2011, uh, was it uh, half of uh, a mega count per second. And uh, just when uh, we decide to put all, the, all this uh, technology together, we reach a number for that count uh, less than uh, 0.05 mega count per second. This showed that the technology was mature, and it is mature from this time. If you look at the, the silicon photomultiplier all around, and all the people that speak about uh, detector with silicon photomultiplier, they use uh, this kind of family. How they realize uh, they improve the silicon photomultiplier using uh, resistive uh, uh, metal uh, uh, instead uh, of uh, original uh, silicon uh, oxide, they perform uh, and use a trench between pixels to avoid uh, uh, optical uh, coupling. And this is the, was uh, a picture with uh, an old photomultiplier because 2014. And this is uh, a uh, single photon, double photon, tri tri triple photon, but this is uh, only noise. It is not photons. This is uh, the new silicon photomultiplier started from this date. You see only a uh, noise uh, at uh, one pixel, and it, sometimes uh, a pixel starts to, uh, to create noise, but this is only one pixel. It's difficult to have a double pixel or triple pixel. In the same time, uh, we work uh, with uh, this uh, new microcontroller, and uh, the, the solution of this microcontroller is uh, the Sentry X8, uh, comes just in the same time we put it together. What, are, what happened this uh, microcontroller? This microcontroller unit, uh, instead of a unit of a processor where you have uh, uh, the CPU core and you have uh, some cache and the memory outside, and now you have also multiple core, you have uh, a CPU unit uh, inside the chip and many, many, many peripheral units, especially for uh, communication, but uh, some uh, of these units are useful for us. Normally they use this new uh, unit, uh, these digital blocks, uh, this is uh, a digital counters uh, up to 42 megahertz uh, with a resolution 25 nanoseconds. Uh, and uh, in the idea of the cast structure of this chip, uh, it, they use uh, only for PWM Contro motors control, or uh, looks uh, inside the, the, the automobile, uh, the, the cars, uh, uh, the speed, or other things. For us, uh, the, same, uh, the same unit, uh, and we have uh, nine of these units, uh, can be used uh, as a time measurement, event counting, uh, pulse generation, uh, produce delay time, <coughs> and uh, we can synchronize with external source. Inside this chip, uh, there is also uh, two uni uh, one unit uh, of 12-bit, uh, uh, one microsample uh, in DC. 
is a complex design. Uh, the, this, uh, this company is not so, it's not so easy to realize uh, outside uh, where uh, there are a lot of competence of this because uh, any time uh, you put analog uh, and digital together, it is not so easy. It's uh, only for this big company. And they have uh, this unit uh, that we can use as a pulse peak measurements, HV monitoring, threshold monitoring, and we use the digital analog converter, it's uh, another block of these, uh, as a threshold settings. At the end, we put all together, we have a scintillator, a silicon photomultiplier, a voltage amplifier, a peak hold, fast discriminator, all this, uh, this signal plus the DC, DC control and temperature sensors go inside uh, this mi microcontroller. What can we can measure with this device? Uh, we can measure the distance between uh, events uh, and we start from this uh, window. Uh, normally we set this window at uh, one second and we have uh, a number of clock for uh, the beginning uh, from the starting point, uh, the, uh, the peak uh, of the signal and the number of uh, the signal. Then we have uh, counters, TDC and uh, ADC for signal. And we, we come out uh, just with the data ready for, <coughs> for be uh, used. Then uh, we have uh, this information uh, j just outside uh, or we can uh, use it inside or put in uh, an SSD card, for example, as an example. Look about uh, the time measurements. Any acquisition comes uh, one second back uh, seconds. And the possibility that we discover inside this block uh, of uh, synchronization is very fancy for us because uh, we can look at the synchronization and uh, have a synchronization window by window one second. Oh, well, if you look uh, at the normal uh, crystals uh, for uh, CPU, they have uh, uh, an error of about uh, 100 uh, ppm. This, uh, it's, it's a lot. And then uh, you can use uh, just to synchronize uh, two of uh, our detectors, and we use uh, to synchronize multiple detectors. If you want, we want something more uh, fancy, we can use uh, a chip scale atomic clock. This is uh, produced by uh, microchip technology is uh, 0 0.5 uh, pico uh, part per, per billions uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, like one centimeter for one centimeter is uh, uh, an advanced uh, <coughs> advanced uh, uh, project from uh, okay the, there's a millimeter inside uh, obviously because uh, uh, they, they use when the, they have uh, the GPS outside the view but uh, a simple me uh, method to synchronize uh, these windows is just uh, with the GPS clock. As you know, the GPS uh, is a, a reference clock, uh, is a very cheap uh, reference clock, uh, and uh, it's right, it's right uh, to have uh, an atomic clock just uh, near to you. And uh, we, for, for example, we use uh, a simple GPS uh, of uh, 20, 20 euro, 30 euro, that comes out with uh, the signal uh, of uh, parts per second uh, to synchronize uh, and uh, to have uh, precision of uh, 20 nanosecond uh, accuracy just uh, using uh, this uh, small module. Then uh, if we want, uh, we can synchronize multiple uh, of these uh, detectors uh, that stay uh, also kilometers away because we, we have uh, the, the right clock for everyone. At the end, uh, what we have done uh, is Arto uh, uh, CPM uh, is the name uh, of the detector. It was uh, one uh, of the first uh, product uh, with uh, an FN technology transfer logo. And uh, it, it is possible, uh, okay, to, to buy externally. We, we have done uh, not to, to gain money, in, uh, there are no money around, but uh, the idea is uh, to use this detector for uh, young student especially or uh, in the university but uh, we have used uh, uh, this detector also for uh, dissemination in fields uh, outside uh, our 
uh, our institute, uh, and then uh, we use uh, an example in analytical chemistry to measure the, uh, the flux of uh, photons, uh, and we test uh, this uh, apparatus that is, is done with our uh, uh, RDO-CPM, and uh, it is better than a normal camera, also astronomical camera cooled, and uh, it's typical uh, equal uh, to uh, desktop uh, uh, measurement system. And we are publishing uh, analytical chemistry with the group uh, of Bologna of uh, analytical chemistry of uh, Lisa Michelini. The idea is also to use uh, in time uh, domain astronomy. In this case, uh, as you know, we, we have uh, this uh, reference in time, and there are people around that are uh, search for a possible optical counterpart to faster radio bust. There's an article just in April uh, about uh, one uh, example. And uh, okay, th this is done uh, also from uh, others group. Uh, and uh, uh, you see a poster with uh, ultra fast infrared detector for astronomy uh, in, the, in the poster section. Okay, we arrive uh, uh, now. We have done uh, a collaboration with Microchip, uh, that's uh, one of the uh, most important uh, product uh, producer of Microchip, uh, of, uh, uh, of this kind of chip. Uh, and then we design uh, a new board uh, with uh, two microcontrollers. The size uh, is, uh, one uh, is uh, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. The weight is uh, only 42 grams. Uh, you can attach uh, any CPM and uh, any scintillator. And then uh, you have uh, a system that uh, can go in, the, in a CubeSat uh, just uh, for uh, ra radiation monitoring. It is uh, the, the size uh, and the photo of the, this prototype. What is the difference from the previous one? That uh, this technology is scanning technology. What we have in uh, 2014 is different from what we have now and probably is different uh, in the future. Then uh, we invest our time because we know that this, this technology is faster than other technology. In this case, we have uh, this same, some uh, V71. Uh, that's, uh, uh, it is uh, also in uh, radiation uh, hardened, uh, radiation tolerant uh, uh, chip. And then we have a 32 bit uh, cortex at 300 megahertz. The old one was 84 megahertz. Two mega sample instead of one mega sample. We have more memory and more <coughs> feature in the analog part. And uh, we have done uh, a micro project with uh, compact electronics uh, for, for uh, bioluminescence and uh, particle detector. And these are two regimes, in this case uh, of a photon detector for uh, uh, particles. We have uh, three 100 photons coming all together. In the other case, we have uh, million photon distributed uh, in uh, seconds. It's a different regime. Okay, just uh, a very fast show of the uh, optical test bench. Uh, uh, we uh, realize an uh, optical test bench. We have uh, a precision now with uh, our discriminator of uh, 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 60, 600 picoseconds. That is enough for this technology because uh, we can uh, resolve uh, the pulses uh, with a precision of 6.6 uh, nanoseconds uh, for free because it's uh, the internal clock uh, of, uh, of, the, of the microcontroller. We have uh, a, a test of a peak called uh, circuit, uh, circuits. The ADC is a very complex module. Okay. The ADC is very complex module and there, there are a lot, a lot of uh, parameter that we can play. I don't say that uh, it's a complex uh, as an F FPGA, but uh, I can say that uh, any of these modules uh, have a very complex uh, parameter th that uh, you can play. This is uh, an example of uh, automatic uh, characterization uh, of uh, uh, CPM with uh, an automatic uh, uh, threshold scan. Uh, we see the CPM uh, one photo, two photo, three photo electrons. What is uh, our next step? Uh, our next step uh, is uh, not only CubeSat satellite uh, with 10 by 10, uh, but uh, we are uh, in contact with some factory in Italy, some, <coughs> uh, 
they, wa they want uh, to use uh, our system in the Pico satellite. In this case, uh, we can use scintillator with CPM and nano hard CPM board, or a photon sensitivity uh, IR, um, visible or IR uh, second photomultiplier. And uh, we want to use uh, a piece of uh, a complex microcontroller. And uh, with this microcontroller, as an onboard computer of this system, consider this is 5 by 5 by 10. And we can control antenna, camera module, uh, magnetic torque module to the uh, axis. And uh, we are in the LEO orbits. Uh, and uh, as you know, the GPS is the uh, main orbit. And then you can use uh, the GPS uh, as a reference time. Uh, this is a complex uh, target, but uh, I think we can uh, arrive in one year in this, uh, uh, in this uh, small, uh, small part, because uh, we have uh, just two little boards, five by five. Conclusion. The new microcontroller units uh, have an interesting CPU power and integrate many peripherals. As uh, my colleague said before, it's, uh, the main core of this CPU is uh, the ARM that uh, have uh, very good uh, power versus, uh, <coughs> versus cost. Uh, there are inside this uh, counter, the C, the, uh, the AC, uh, and then we don't need so many components outside. Uh, the counter speed uh, increased with the CPU clock. Uh, as you see, the, the first version was a 20 nanosecond resolution. Now we have 6.6 .6 nanoseconds resolution. And uh, with appropriate firmware, uh, we create uh, a light uh, and uh, all in one detector where uh, there is a, a sensor for the uh, front end electronics trigger. Uh, the CTDC scaler, and uh, we can do duck elaboration. And now with uh, enough memory, also <coughs> histograms uh, or uh, other uh, things uh, inside this CPU. The performance uh, grow with, uh, with the time, and uh, is a, a very important technology. And we can just link to this technology and do what we want to do. Uh, the new MPU system on chip uh, can integrate multiple functions, and then uh, you use uh, only part of this chip, not all the chip. And then you have a radiation detector, satellite, satellite controls, uh, satellite uh, communication, uh, control of the camera, just in one chip. The, we <coughs> shrink uh, the electronics uh, up to level of a few uh, cubes uh, centimeter. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the talk. Thanks for that. There is time for one question. So maybe I, nobody. Maybe I have one. Are you planning to do space qualification before launching? No, because I, I, th I think it's different from the yeah. normal uh, qualification so for the space for this uh, few uh, the little module. You just uh, send and try. Try. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very fast. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We go to the next speaker. So this is about uh, Crystal Eye, a new X and a gamma ray. Uh, all sky monitor for space uh, mission from uh, uh, Felicia Barbato. Yeah. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Felicia Barbato from Grand Sasso Science Institute. Um, this evening, I want to talk to you about the Crystal Eye, that is a new idea for an X and gamma ray all sky monitor for space mission. Uh, so in order to drive you through this new idea, I want to start from the energy range of interest. So we know that uh, we had uh, um, wonderful experiments that were giving impressive results uh, 
in the hard X-ray and low energy gamma rays, let's say from 10 to 200 keV, and uh, in the high energy uh, gamma ray energy range, starting from uh, 1 GeV, but uh, the medium energy uh, range is still underexplored. But from uh, uh, some latest results, uh, we understood that in this uh, energy range, uh, uh, we, we find uh, powerful probes uh, for the extreme universe. I was keeping here two plots uh, from two very important uh, observations. The first one was about uh, the observation of a GRB in coincidence with a gravitational wave made in August uh, 2017. And the second is about the, the blazer uh, in, uh, in coincidence with uh, a neutrino. So in the first case, uh, what we can see is that uh, the localization made by uh, the two um, gamma ray experiment is way worse with respect to the localization made by uh, the gravitational wave experiment. Uh, while in the second plot, uh, what, we, what we see is that we can cover with the current experiment all, almost all the energy spectrum, but not uh, the medium energies. So from, uh, starting from these two observations, uh, we made uh, an analysis uh, of the technology issue that, uh, um, that we are facing, and we started uh, to think to a new concept. Uh, as an example, we took uh, uh, two different techniques. Uh, one was exploited by Beposax, uh, that was uh, a satellite uh, uh, for X-ray detection uh, that was using a full switch technique uh, that was using uh, actually two different crystal read by the same uh, photomultiplier. Uh, and so it was taking uh, a complicated electronics uh, for the pulse shape discrimination. Uh, this one uh, uh, was um, um, complemented by collimators uh, and uh, a movable mechanics uh, that was able to point in different direction. Uh, an evolution of this technique uh, was made by Fermi GBM, uh, in which we can see that we have uh, uh, different um, uh, detectors made by big crystals uh, with different orientation read by uh, PMTs. Uh, one other thing is that in both cases, uh, uh, we are speaking about uh, one detection module. Uh, that means uh, that in case uh, the, the experiment is uh, in uh, heart of occultation, uh, it can miss uh, the observation uh, uh, with the other experiment. So from this analysis, uh, uh, we started to conceive the crystal eye, that is a semispherical semi detector that is exploiting new materials that are optimized for the detection of gamma rays, meaning the lysocrystals, and new sensors that are today mature uh, to be used also in much more complicated uh, experiment. Uh, in this case, we are dealing uh, about um, CPM arrays. By using the CPM arrays, uh, we can reduce uh, uh, the, the power co uh, consumption and uh, uh, we can make a very compact experiment. So, in this case, instead of uh, uh, using a few pixels uh, with different orientation and exploit a triangulation on only 12 pixels, we can make a very compact uh, uh, object uh, with a high pixelation and uh, um, uh, we can uh, uh, read the charge clouds uh, over uh, 112 pixels that are contained in this same sphere. Um, one, another, uh, another feature is that uh, thanks to the use of the CPM array, uh, we don't need anymore to use the uh, full switch technique, so we can uh, directly use uh, the same crystal divided in two uh, different uh, parts, uh, and each one is read by its own uh, CPM array. Um, the last uh, but not least uh, is that uh, uh, being very compact uh, and so also quite light, uh, we can use a constellation of more modules uh, in order to have uh, uh, constantly a uh, full sky coverage to don't miss uh, uh, any observation. So um, we are saying that uh, thanks to the progress uh, that uh, these technologies were knowing in the last year, the time for a new concept uh, is exactly now. 
So let's see uh, better how is made the crystal eye. I already told you that we have two shells of, uh, of crystals that uh, are uh, somehow a simplified uh, for switch. So we have uh, uh, what we call uh, the up pixel, uh, the down pixel, uh, each read by its own uh, CPM array. And we have a tile that is a, uh, of plastic scintillator that is acting uh, as veto, but it's also useful to extend the, uh, the energy range of sensitivity to hard X-rays. The detector uh, uh, so conceived is uh, uh, with a radius of only 20 centimeters, uh, with uh, a reasonable mass of 50 kilos, uh, and is sensitive in the energy range uh, from ten, ten, almost 10 keV up to 30 MeV. Um, this detector uh, with, its, uh, with, it, with its sides uh, is uh, able to be a free flyer satellite, but uh, can also be installed on space station or uh, even uh, can be used uh, as a sub-detector uh, for uh, larger missions. Uh, this configuration made by two shells of LISO is also smart, uh, not only for the compactness and the symmetry that uh, can ensure to the detector, but also because the LISO crystals that are very dense uh, are offering also thermal and radiation protection to the CPM that are in the, in the, um, in the interleaved bell. Um, from a first bunch of uh, simulation, uh, we, uh, we were uh, finding the effective area of, uh, of the crystal eye. Here you can see one uh, crystal eye module effective area compared to other, to other experiments. Uh, so with this technique, uh, we are enlarging uh, the Fermi GBM uh, effective area of one order of magnitude, uh, and uh, we are spanning from uh, different uh, uh, energies. So we can be uh, a, an observational link among uh, low energy um, low energy experiment and a high energy experiment. Um, uh, the, the method in which we distinguish the different uh, events uh, is based, based on several triggers that we can collect. In case only the anti-coincidence tile is fired, we consider this uh, as a, a downgoing uh, hard X-ray. Uh, in the second case, instead, we consider as a downgoing uh, low energy gamma ray, then we have uh, a medium energy gamma ray that is making uh, Compton scattering in the two pixels. And then uh, the, the last two are considered to be char low energy charged particles. Um, so uh, what we expect uh, to, to uh, how we expect to localize uh, our source uh, uh, is uh, uh, through the charge distribution uh, over the detector. So we expect uh, that uh, a group of pixels that are uh, pointing uh, in the direction of the source are more fired, uh, so with a higher rate and uh, with a higher um, uh, energy resolution with respect to the others. Um, uh, here you can see simulation made in Gen 4 uh, uh, of uh, 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 this is the detector seen from the top, and this is the detector seen from the side. Uh, uh, here you can see um, a, a gamma rays coming from the zenith, uh, here coming from uh, 45 degrees, uh, and here coming from uh, 90 degrees, so a lateral uh, event. Uh, um, I'm uh, sorry that uh, here there was a GIF that is not working in PDF that was showing how uh, the charge clouds is moving uh, with respect to the, 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 the position of the source. But with this method, we, uh, we were uh, making an estimation of the angular resolution to be around one degree. Uh, today, we are assembling a prototype that is going to fly in one year uh, aboard of the Space Rider that is a vehicle by ISAM. Uh, and uh, in this uh, prototype, we are scaling down the, the detector and we are using only three pixels that uh, are allowing us to, uh, to set uh, a basic uh, trigger logic. Um, uh, for, uh, with this detector, uh, what we are going to do is to enable, of course, the technology for space use. Uh, 
Uh, and also, uh, we, uh, since uh, the space rider is able to change uh, orbit uh, and orientation, we are, uh, we are asking for uh, five weeks of deep space observation and one week of Earth observation, uh, uh, hoping to hunt for uh, also terrestrial gamma ray flashes. Uh, this is, these are pictures of the first assembly in which actually you can see that there are four pixels instead, uh, instead of three because one of these is made of uh, BGO that will be not used uh, in the uh, flight detector. Uh, so you can see that here we have uh, the down pixel, then uh, on the down pixel are positioned the, the, the CPM arrays that are covered inside this uh, this mechanical module, and, and so we proceed with the up pixel. Uh, th this is a picture uh, uh, showing in a more detail uh, how the pixel is made. And finally, um, you can see here that we are reading the CPM array uh, thanks to this little board that is dividing the array, the array in uh, four quarters that ensure redundancy for the readout. Uh, for uh, for uh, this uh, Pathfinder, uh, we developed uh, together uh, with uh, INFN Naples uh, uh, and uh, Nuclear Instruments uh, uh, a board that is containing uh, uh, both the front end and the DAQ. Uh, so this board is based uh, on the use of the CityRock 1A, uh, that is a, a chip uh, that is collecting the, sig the analog signal and is uh, giving. Uh, uh, the, the spectrum, uh, the charge spectrum, uh, and everything is managed by the, this uh, module by TRANS, uh, that is a system on chip uh, uh, that is uh, collecting uh, and uh, setting different trigger logics, uh, and is also ex exchanging uh, uh, data with the, with the space rider, and uh, everything will, will be collected also in these two uh, memories. This is because the space rider is a re-entry uh, re module, so after two months uh, of mission, uh, everything will come back uh, and we will collect again our instrument. Um, so for, uh, um, for the logic uh, of the DAQ, we have two different uh, modes. Uh, the first one is the calibration mode and the second is the observation mode. Uh, we made some tests uh, to, to check the, um, uh, how, it, uh, how these two methods, uh, these two methods work. Uh, and uh, this is the calibration mode. For the calibration mode, we were asking a majority of three of, of the four uh, quadrants uh, and the core of the crystal. So we are reading uh, actually each crystal in single fold. Uh, the LISO crystal uh, is uh, a radioactive uh, crystal uh, and so we are reading uh, this emission uh, spectrum uh, and collecting uh, the two most evident peaks uh, that are the 88 uh, uh, keV and uh, uh, 597 keV uh, and based on the collection of these two, uh, of these two points uh, we are making our calibration. After the calibration, we move to, uh, um, uh, to pa uh, passing by the calibration uh, to the data mode, uh, we are actually exploiting uh, the majority of uh, two fired pixels. And so with this logic, uh, we are uh, um, uh, putting down uh, the spectrum uh, from uh, uh, almost uh, uh, seven, uh, uh, seven kilohertz to uh, almost uh, 60 kilohertz. Uh, sorry, to 60 Hz. Um, after uh, the calibration, we were making some proofs uh, uh, made with, uh, uh, with uh, sodium sources. And what we saw is that pointing the source uh, uh, in, uh, on a specific pixel means, uh, uh, as expected, that uh, the, the pixel in the direction uh, of the source is more fired than the other and has a better uh, energy resolution. And uh, we can uh, reconstruct, uh, uh, based on the calibration, uh, the two uh, photopeak of the, um, of the sodium, uh, respectively, respectively with 6.2% uh, and 5.3% uh, uh, accuracy. 
uh, we made the same uh, by moving the source uh, on another pixel. Things were changing, uh, meaning that uh, actually the, the, the correspondent pixel was more fired and more uh, resoluted with respect to the other. And we, uh, and we found uh, uh, these results here. One thing that I want to show you is that uh, in the histosum of uh, the different uh, coincidence uh, uh, possibilities, uh, we find that uh, uh, only the three uh, coincidences among the upper pixel are interested, uh, while all the other coincidences uh, um, uh, just have few events uh, and doesn't show any spectrum. Uh, we made the same uh, with the uh, cobalt uh, by putting the cobalt source on the top and then in the middle and we found uh, our, uh, uh, our results. I want to go to this uh, last point uh, that for me is very important. Uh, so the crystal eye has just been financed for uh, uh, 4.5 million uh, with a PNRR for advanced space technologies. Uh, and uh, in three years by now, uh, we have uh, to deliver a full crystallized satellite uh, in uh, collaboration with uh, Thales Alenia Space uh, and FPK. Uh, moreover, uh, we also submitted uh, a print uh, to finance uh, um, a part of the development. And uh, what is most important for me, and I want to tell you today, is that our group at GSSI is increasing, uh, is growing up, uh, and uh, we need uh, more young researchers. Uh, so today I'm asking you uh, to put a lot of attention to this, uh, and uh, I'm asking to the senior scientists to spread uh, this new to their uh, students. Uh, and also to the young uh, that are interested uh, in this kind of developments uh, to keep in contact with me uh, in order to, to, to look for a possible collaboration uh, and to come to our group. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Felicia. I like this instrument. It looks very nice. I like the idea that you recycle the instrument after it has been launched yes. and you don't waste it in space. So that is... Time for questions. Hi, Felicia. Um, well, two quick questions. They are mm -hmm. more or less related. Uh, first of all, did you carry out any harness uh, tests to the detectors? And the second, uh, about the long-term uh, operation of these detectors, since they will be in space. OK. Thank you. Uh, so for the, for the first part, uh, uh, there's not the, uh, such a particular harness because uh, it's just that small detector uh, and the board will be positioned very, very close. Uh, everything is positioned on, um, um, let's say, on a wall that is thermalized by, uh, by Space Rider. Uh, and um, so we don't need, in this specific case, we don't need uh, uh, specific test. Uh, for the long term, uh, um, uh, I don't know because we are at the beginning, of course, uh, but the idea is that the mission should stand at least for three years uh, in space. So everything will be designed to survive at least for three years. So I, I don't know if this is something stupid, but have you looked into the uh, polarization sensitivity uh, for Compton events? Uh, actually, not yet. Uh, uh, many persons were making this question. I am studying, but I still don't know. I have a, a question related to the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, how large are the crystals? Uh, the crystals are very small. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, each side is uh, one centimeter point uh, two millimeters. And uh, the up crystals are uh, four centimeter uh, uh, thick, while the lowest one, uh, the down uh, pixel, are three centimeter th uh, thick. So then when you're calculating the sensitivity, you're assuming you'll read out the whole array, not, not get a trigger from a single crystal? No. Uh, we assume that uh, uh, the, the GRB is covering all the array mm -hmm. uh, because for sure uh, we, we will collect signal uh, everywhere. Um, and, uh, with, but uh, the, the starting trigger is uh, a coincidence among two crystals. Okay, thank you. More questions? Okay, there we go. Thanks, uh, Felicia, again.
we move on to the next talk, which is, I think, the last one of this session. Yeah. So that is uh, Alberto Monfreda, and we talk about the gas pixel detector for the imaging X-ray polarimeter explorer. Finally, some instrument that's end up into space at the science. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm Alberto Manfreda from INFN Pisa. Uh, I will talk about the gas pixel detectors for the uh, IXP mission. Um, so. Uh, it is a uh, uh, well polarimetry. It's uh, um, a well-established tool um, to study the physics of uh, um, astrophysical sources. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, at high, um, high frequencies, so X-rays and gamma rays, um, the um, technique for polarimetry are still uh, uh, significantly undeveloped compared to other wavelengths. Uh, and specifically in the soft uh, X-ray uh, range, so below 10 kV, uh, we actually uh, have measured polarization just for a single source, which is the Crab Nebula. And this was done uh, um, more or less 50 years ago. Um, the situation is uh, um, about to change now, uh, since uh, uh, in uh, last December, um, NASA successfully uh, launched the IXP mission. Uh, this is a, a mission funded by a, a partnership between uh, NASA and the Italian Space Agency, uh, which is completely dedicated to uh, measuring X-ray um, polarimetry. Um, and during its, uh, uh, its lifespan, which is uh, expected to be uh, at least two years, uh, it will measure uh, polarization in the soft X-ray band uh, for uh, uh, tens of um, X-ray sources for the first time. Um, the payload of IXP uh, is made of uh, three identical telescopes. Um, each one is made of a, a, an X-ray mirror, uh, and uh, on the focal plane at a four-meter distance, uh, there is uh, um, um, the polarization-sensitive detector, which is the um, gas pixel detector. Um, more in detail, the two telescope com components, the X-ray optics, which are fabricated uh, by the Marshall uh, um, Fly Space Center in Alabama, are the standard uh, Volter 1 uh, uh, type uh, X-ray mirrors with a uh, um, total effective area of um, 540 uh, centimeters square at, at its peak and uh, an measured angular resolution uh, better than, uh, slightly better than 30 arcoseconds. And uh, um, on the focal plane, the gas pixel detectors are hosted inside these detector units, which you see here, um, which also hosts the, um, the electronic boards, the HV boards, the thermal control. And on top um, of the detector, there is a um, mechanical wheel that can be rotated. It is usually in the open position for no normal uh, operation and uh, astrophysical observations, but it can be rotated to illuminate the detector with uh, uh, a few calibration sources for monitoring the performances of the detector um, in orbit. Uh, so um, how does the gas pixel detector work. So the basic idea is to exploit the photoelectric effect, which is the dominant effect uh, in this energy range. Um, the K shell, um, photoelectron emitted in a K shell uh, from uh, um, uh, linearly polarized uh, beam um, are 100% modulated uh, in the plane um, orthogonal to the uh, incident direction of the photon. Uh, and that means that um, the uh, emission direction of the, uh, of the photoelectron, this uh, angle phi here, uh, essentially remembers the 
uh, direction of, uh, um, uh, of oscillation of the electric field. Uh, so if you're able to um, measure the direction of emission of the photoelectron, you can perform polarimetry. Um, the, typical the typical track length in a solid medium for a few kV electron, uh, it's uh, too short uh, to actually do that. So uh, you need a gas detector, essentially. Uh, and one, that one uh, detector concept that can do this is the gas, gas pixel detector. Um, this concept was invented uh, uh, 20 years ago uh, at um, INFN Pisa. Um, and the idea is that the, there is a gas cell in which the, um, phot the photon is uh, absorbed and the photoelectron produces uh, an ionization track in the gas. Um, the charge is drifted uh, toward the bottom where there is uh, an amplification stage, which is a, ga a gas electron multiplier and uh, um, a, segment a segmented anode. Uh, and uh, in the end, what you get is uh, uh, an image of the projection of the photoelectron track on the um, uh, perpendicular plane to the incident photon uh, uh, direction. And if your detector is uh, good enough from this uh, uh, few hundred microns track, uh, you are able to extract to, um, to analyze. You are able to analyze this track to extract the conversion uh, point uh, of the of the photon, uh, which gives you. Um, after integrating many photons, give you the image of the source. Uh, you're able to measure the energy of each photon uh, by the collected uh, charge, so you can do spectroscopy. And more importantly, uh, if you measure the uh, direction emission of the uh, photoelectron, um, you integra by integrating many photons, you can get uh, uh, an histogram like this, so you can measure the polarization. And um, uh, while, I'm, while I'm at this, uh, I'm at this uh, histogram, uh, I'll spend a moment to introduce two uh, relevant uh, metrics. Um, one is the modulation factor. The modulation factor is essentially um, the response of your detector uh, to a 100% uh, uh, polari polarized radiation. So for an ideal detector, this curve should be modulated up to, uh, 100%, so up to the x-axis. But in real life, uh, since you have an uncertainty so the, um, direct on the measurement on the direction emission, um, the, what you get is slightly demodulated, so the modulation factor measure the quality of your uh, uh, polarimeter. It's a number between uh, zero and one. One means uh, very good. Um, the other, the other number, important number, is the uh, minimum detectable polarization, which is essentially um, the 99, per, um, the upper bound of the 99% confidence level. Um, for, uh, um, uh, for the null hypothesis of an unpolarized radiation. And this number t tells you essentially uh, what's the amplitude of the modulation that you can measure given your detector and the number of photons you collected. Uh, and if you plug the numbers in, you see that to measure uh, um, polarization amplitude of a few percent, you need immediately need uh, more than 100,000 uh, photons. So for polarization, polarimetry is really photon grid. Um, the gas pixel detector, which were uh, um, designed and assembled for IXP um, at uh, INFN um, in Pisa, um, they are uh, made by a gas cell uh, with uh, side walls of ceramics and uh, closed uh, on top by a titanium frame and on the bottom by the PCB, which shows the readout uh, ASIC. Um, in the titanium frame, there is a, a, a an entrance window for the photons, which is closed by a beryllium, um, which, which is closed by a, a beryllium window, which is transparent for uh, uh, X-rays uh, essentially above uh, 2 kV, and it's uh, um, uh, 50, 50 micron uh, uh, thick. Um, the active area of this uh, uh, detector is 15 by 15 millimeter square. Um, and the, the, the size of the absorption gas is, uh, the thickness of the absorption gas is uh, one centimeter and is filled with uh, DME, uh, pure DME at uh, 800 millibars. And these, these numbers have been uh, specifically optimized uh, for the energy range of, of interest of uh, XP, which is between 2 and 8 kV, um, by a, um, 
a trade-off between the efficiency and the modulation factor. This is actually um, uh, easy to understand. If you want to collect more photons, so to increase the efficiency, you need either to make the detector uh, uh, more thick or to increase the pressure. But if you make the detector more thick, um, then the, you increase the drift uh, distance, so you have more diffusion. Uh, and if you increase the pressure, uh, you get uh, uh, more multiple scattering in the gas from the photoelectron, so you decrease, uh, your, you confuse the reconstruction of the, um, of the track. And so you, um, if you put all these effects into a uh, simulation, you get a, a plot like this, and, and you can see that uh, the working point for uh, our, uh, for our design are essentially in the maximum of this sensitivity plot. Um, the technological heart of the GPD is this, um, is this chip, which is a, a custom uh, uh, readout ASIC, specifically designed uh, uh, for, the, for, the, for this task. Um, the basic idea here is that uh, um, each pixel in this uh, uh, matrix of pixel of 100,000 uh, pixels um, at the same time act as a charge collecting anode but also uh, implement uh, a fully out chain uh, with uh, um, amplifier and, uh, and shaper. Um, the, the ASIC has two, um, has two main features. The, the main feature, the one um, is that it is self-triggering um, and uh, upon triggering, it is uh, automatically uh, able to uh, select a region of interest, which is a rectangular, uh, um, a rectangular subsample of the entire ASIC, which contains all the pixels above trigger threshold. Uh, and in that way, you only read um, a small subsample of the, of the entire ASIC, which keep the dead time to an acceptable level, around one millisecond. Uh, the other uh, main feature is uh, it is uh, a very low noise uh, um, device, and this allow you to um, it this allow you to have uh, um, a 100, essentially 100 percent trigger efficiency down to one kV, while keeping the noise uh, uh, very low, uh, much lower than one hertz. The other uh, a relevant technological part of the uh, GPD is the gas electron multiplier. Um, for uh, uh, IXP, the, the gem has been produced by uh, Riken in collaboration with the Sai Energy in Japan. Uh, and, um, and, and this gem have a, um, a 50 micron uh, pitch, so very, uh, quite small pitch to match the, um, to match the, the pitch of the, uh, readout, uh, of the readout ASIC. Um, the gas pixel detectors have been uh, um, uh, assembled uh, in uh, the clear room of the INFN uh, in Pisa. Um, since this, those are um, sealed detector, uh, which is good because you don't need a gas system uh, uh, on, the, on the satellite. On the other side, you have a, a very tight requirement on, on, the, uh, on the tightness. Um, and, and so the, the assembly is uh, um, quite uh, delicate. You have several layers of ma different materials uh, with uh, different expansion coefficient, uh, which have to uh, you know, undergo um, the vibration during the launch and also the thermovacuum, uh, um, the, the, the thermovacuum um, environment in space. Uh, so this is quite quite delicate, delicate process. Uh, the, um, the bake-out and the filling with the ME was performed uh, at Oxford Instrument uh, in Finland. Uh, and then uh, each GPD has been tested for leak tightness, uh, again, in, uh, in PISA. Uh, once uh, uh, integrated inside the DU, uh, um, each detector has been tested, um, sorry, uh, before integrating in, uh, in the DU, each detector has been uh, uh, tested to, um, to assess uh, that it actually meets the requirement for the mission. Uh, so um, for uh, energy resolution, modulation factor, and so on. And we actually got 100% uh, uh, yield. So all our flight GPD has been, uh, have been accepted as ready to flight. 
uh, and uh, uh, after integration in the detector unit, each detector unit has been uh, qualified for space, so it underwent electrical test, vibrational test, and thermovacuum test, and finally uh, calibration with uh, polarized and unpolarized source at the uh, EAPS facility in uh, Rome. Uh, the um, most important uh, um, performance of the gas pixel detector is the uh, modulation factor, which is 54% uh, at uh, uh, 6.4 kV, so high energy, and 28% uh, at low energy. Um, as, a, as, a, um, as I said, the GPD is able at the same time to measure energy, uh, position, and uh, time uh, for each photon. Uh, the, the metrics, uh, the, the performance for these uh, other measurements may not sound impressive compared to dedicating the instruments, uh, but uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, our measurements are, all, are always statistically limited. Uh, so these numbers are good enough to perform uh, polar inventory resolved uh, in space, energy, and time. Um, I, I think I'm skipping this one um, because I don't have time. So the, uh, finally, we get to the launch, which uh, happened uh, uh, in, on uh, December uh, from uh, uh, Cape Canaveral on a uh, Falcon 9. Uh, the detector reached the, uh, the satellite reached the, um, its equatorial orbit at uh, 600 kilometer uh, altitude. And after one month, one month commissioning, in which we verified uh, uh, all the subsystem and also uh, the instrument, we started collecting data, which we have been doing uh, uh, until now without any major issues. So all the subsystem and uh, uh, all the instruments are, are fully working. Uh, the way the, um, the XP uh, observes target is that it uh, uh, point one source and it uh, keep the observing it for a quite long time, uh, typically from days to weeks. Uh, because it, it needs to collect the, uh, a lot of photons, as I said. Uh, the data uh, after uh, the um, reconstruction are, are immediately made public within a week. Um, and uh, we have observed up to now uh, 20, uh, 19 sources. Uh, and we, have, uh, um, we can already confirm detection of polarization for eight of these sources. That doesn't mean that uh, there isn't polarization in the others. Uh, it means that uh, it is uh, uh, less striking, so they are still uh, uh, under uh, analysis. The, the, the we, have, we are observing both uh, galactic and extragalactic sources. Uh, uh, I don't have the time to speak about all these targets, um, but I want, to, um, uh, I want to underline a couple of examples, just because they show how the capabilities of the GPD are relevant for uh, uh, sci for, sci for the science of IXP. Uh, the first one are supernova remnant, which are considered uh, good candidates for cosmic ray uh, acceleration up to the so-called knee. Uh, now, uh, the synchrotron emission from uh, these sources is expected to be locally uh, high highly polarized, but once you, um, since the magnetic field is turbulent, once you integrate um, the entire object, essentially the, the polarization averaged to zero. So in order to, be, to measure something and uh, to probe the, um, the level of turbulence and how, uh, how much the magnetic field is ordered, you really need to be able to uh, use the imaging capability of the GPD to study subsample. And here you see that for our first, actual first target, which was CASA, uh, um, we are able to measure, uh, to reach a sensitivity, sorry, uh, in some region with, uh, which are the brighter, uh, of the order of uh, 5% uh, um, minimal uh, um, MDP. Uh, and the other example is uh, um, our magnetars, which are uh, uh, ultra-magnetized uh, uh, neutron stars with uh, extreme uh, magnetic fields. Um, so I, in fact, that it is possible to test an old QED prediction, which is uh, the, that the vacuum become uh, birefringent. Um, a few days ago, it was posted on a, uh, it was submitted on archive, uh, 
um, this paper about the first detection of X-ray polarization from a magnetar. Um, the, um, the QED uh, has, has not actually been uh, uh, demonstrated. It's not yet a smoking gun for uh, this uh, effect. But what is uh, really interesting is that we observed uh, a change of polarization angle of 90 degrees between uh, uh, low energy here and uh, um, high energy. So, and, and this may indicate that uh, there are two different uh, components, uh, one uh, um, parallel to the magnetic field and, and the other extraordinary orthogonal to the magnetic field, which are dominating at, at different uh, energies. And in order to, uh, to see that, it's critical. Uh, the, the capability to perform energy resolved polarimetry is actually critical. Um, so with the second example, um, I, I conclude. The, here is a picture of the uh, INFN uh, uh, XP team after the integration of the last detector unit uh, uh, in our clean room. Okay. Thanks, Alberto, for this nice talk. And congratulations for the whole team for this successful mission. So there are time for uh, one or two questions. Thank you. Very nice talk, I have to say. Uh, one question. If I understood it right, you try to uh, uh, reconstruct the photoelectron track yes. by looking at the energy deposition. Now, since electrons can have a pretty convoluted track in media, so does this uh, and then makes the re track reconstruction difficult. Does it happen in your case and or you are fine? So, uh, of course, the um, the scattering of the electron um, decreases the capability to, to measure the initial direction uh, of the photoelectron. But uh, um, the, let's say this is already included in the sensitivity that we have. Uh, if you, you, you can decrease uh, this effect, um, for instance, you can increase the pressure to decrease the, sorry, you can uh, decrease the pressure to uh, decrease the multiple scattering, but then you lose uh, efficiency. So it's a trade-off, let's say. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. I think uh, I'll stay to the slide. Um, electrons, they do not have a Bragg peak. So uh, they, they, the, the peak is more or less one third of the range. So you have actually, if you feed the tracks, you might commit also quite a big mistake in the direction. Because so the Bragg peak is very near to the tail and this is proper of protons, alphas and ions. Electrons, they have the peak one third, one half of the range. So, um, I mean, you may not call it a Bragg peak, but uh, still uh, it's true that uh, uh, the, large, the highest uh, charge you collect, it's at the end of the track. Uh, if the, you know, it, this is, a, this is a, an actual track for the, for our, uh, from our uh, gas pixel detector. So here you see the, um, the tail is clearly separated from the head. Now, if you go to lower energy um, and you, pick, uh, let's say, more unfortunate track where there is a, a large scattering in the first few micron. Of course, you can, you know, at that point, it's difficult to reconstruct, you do a mistake. And that's the reason why the, uh, the modulation at low energy, where the tracks are shorter, it's, it's, uh, uh, the modulation factor is much smaller. It's, uh, let's say, half of the one you get at high energy. But you are still able, you know, statistically speaking, even if you make mistakes on, you know, on some track, statistically speaking, you still measure polarization with uh, less sensitivity. Okay. So I propose that we close the session here. I would like you to thank Alberto again and all the speakers for all the session, including the people uh, submitting the, sub the posters. Regina to make a very nice presentation of all these posters. Okay.
So enjoy the, maybe a quick dive into the sea and <laughs>